Well, shalom everyone. This is August Fizzato with Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries. We want to thank you so much for tuning in on this Thursday afternoon as we come to you live from our main headquarters here in Lincoln, Rhode Island. It's a pretty, another decent day here in the New England area. We are inching ever so closer to the first day of spring. We've already sprang forward, losing an hour of sleep, but we have sprang forward and so the daylight lasts a little bit longer going into the evening. And so uh, I am excited that the warmer weather is coming. And, you know, hey, despite the madness of the world, despite coronavirus diseases, God is on the throne. You know, we need to be careful with all the hype and all the conspiracy theories that are going on out there concerning this coronavirus. God is on the throne. He is in control. This will pass. And so I am really excited about today's broadcast because as promised yesterday, beginning at sundown tonight, is the festival of Purim, the festival of Purim. The events that happened some 2,600 years ago in the book of Esther. And we're going to be looking at that today. So I want to say hello to Artemio Cruz, dear brother in the Lord, our Richard Spencer. Great to see Richard. Charity Barker out of Wyoming, Illinois. Joshua, uh, Nathaniel, let me get this here, Tor Tor Toro Ricci. Hope I got that right. So if I messed that up, I'm sorry, Joshua. But I'm, I'm so glad that all of you have decided to join us on today's broadcast. Let me just say right off the bat in Hebrew, Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach is Hebrew for Happy Holy Days or Happy Holiday because tonight, beginning at sundown, is the festival of Purim. Purim was not part of the seven feasts of Leviticus chapter number 23, but it's one of those extra biblical feast, if you will, in addition to Hanukkah. And so we're going to be talking about uh, Purim. Why do they call it Purim? How are these Jewish festivals born? How, I mean, how do they come about? And so we're going to be looking at all of that in our study today. So as usual, I ask you to do this all the time. Have your Bibles open. Have those scriptures open. Write down some notes. Taking notes is really good. That's another way of getting information into your head. And uh, invite a friend. You know, maybe give someone a quick text right now. Hey, August Rosado is on live. It's public. So see what he has to say about this Jewish festival that begins at sundown tonight, Thursday night, called Purim. P-U-R-I-M. And so... Hope and pray that this study lesson will be a blessing to you. Charity Barker says, sitting here with my King James Bible, blessings, amen, and my coffee, ready to dig into the word. Don't hold back, brother. Well, Joshua, I mean, excuse me, Charity, I really do appreciate that. Glad that you got your King James Bible uh, open and that you're ready to join me in digging into the word of God. Great to see Brother Chuck Snow and Irene White. I know, Irene, our, our trip to Israel has been postponed and rescheduled for June 20th to the 30th. I'm hoping and praying that by then, Irene, this lousy virus would be gone uh, out of our midst and life will return back to normal. So stay tuned uh, for more information as we get closer to that day. But I'm so glad, Irene, that you have decided to join us. And by the way, this is probably a blessing in disguise for Brother Randy Lewis, your pastor, so that if this date is ready to go for June 20th, him and Kathy would be able to join us in Israel as well. So stay tuned for that. And so before we begin with our study lesson today, I want to invite you to visit my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. While you're there, sign up for my newsletters by going to the contact form, okay? Then, I want you to look at all of my late-breaking news stories by going to my Twitter account, 
August Rosado, Bible underscore prophecy. And uh, you'll be able to look at all of my late breaking news stories right there on Twitter. A actually, my Twitter feed feeds also into my website. So you can also look at those late breaking news stories on my website through my Twitter feed. Uh, also, if you want to come to Israel with us, once this, you know, Israel lifts their ban, if you want to come to Israel with us, we have rescheduled our date for June 20th through the 30th, Israel and Jordan. So there is still room for you to come with us to Israel. Hopefully, you know, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that come April 1st, they're going to reassess the situation. I'm thinking maybe by mid-April, maybe the end of April, Israel's going to lift that ban. So that, I mean, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. But they will reassess come April the 1st. So if you've never been to Israel, come to Israel with us. And uh, see where Bible prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Great to see Junior Coleman. Debbie Smith, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us on today's broadcast. And so, um, listen, because of this virus deal here, I had to uh, postpone, well, not me, of course, but the airlines and the tour company. My trip to Israel was scheduled for March 16th. That's not going to happen now. I was going to be in Israel for three weeks, March 16th, through the 27th with Zola Levitt Ministries, and then March 28th to April 7th with my prophecy tour. That ain't going to happen now, obviously. So that leaves me three Sundays open for me to find a church to preach at. If you're a pastor, maybe here in the New England area, and you would like to have me come to your church to preach on Israel, Bible prophecy, and current events, then give us a shout here. At Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries through Facebook or email, august.todayinbibleprophecy at gmail.com. And uh, let me know if you might be interested in those next three Sunday dates. This Sunday, I'll be preaching in East Providence, Rhode Island at East Bay Baptist Church. Tony Barboza is the pastor of that church. We're going to be with them all day Sunday. But after that, I got three Sundays open. And I would love to come to your church to preach on these prophetic truths. If you know me, guys, you know that as a Bible prophecy uh, evangelist, as a student of Bible prophecy, I don't get into the hype, the drama, the conspiracies, the sensationalism. I avoid all that junk. You know, even with this coronavirus business, all these conspiracies are flying all over the place right now. You need to avoid that junk, okay? I just stick with the plain sense interpretation of the Word of God. I look at the geopolitical activities as they're unfolding, and then I give the prophetic perspective of those geopolitical activities. Nothing more, nothing less. I just use the Bible as my final authority. I just use the Bible. For its plain sense interpretation, allowing scripture to interpret scripture. That, if you've known me for a long time, you know that's exactly what I do. I may have over 470 videos on YouTube, but you need to avoid YouTube eschatology. And, you know, these are these conspiracy prophecy guys. That's what they are. They're prophecy conspiracists. And you need to avoid those types. If you're going to watch anybody on YouTube, make sure they're biblically sound. If they're not biblically, biblically sound, stay away from them, will you? Just stay away from them. They will mess you up doctrinally. And so I just stick with the plain sense interpretation of the Word of God. If you're here for the first time today, you'll, you'll get a taste of what I'm about to do today. And hope that you would continue to come back. All right, we got uh, Angelique Marchesi Phillips. Great to see Angelique. Andrew Ladner, great to see Andrew. Uh, Charles, Charles Harmon. And again, thank you so much for tuning in today. And again, I want to say Chag Sameach.
Happy holidays in Hebrew. Beginning at sundown tonight is Purim, Purim. And so I hope that you have your Bibles open to the book of Esther. Because that is where this holiday originates. When I first talked about Purim, I had a pastor tell me one time, he goes, Purim, where, where'd you get that from? I said, uh, sir, it's in the Bible, the book of Esther, chapter number 9. He goes, I've never even heard of Purim before. And this was a guy who had a doctorate. He says, I've never even heard of Purim before. It's because we don't read the Bible with Jewish eyes anymore, folks. We always interpret the Bible with Western thinking. We do. We're guilty of that. We need to understand the Bible in its Jewish context. And if we don't look at it from its Jewish context, well, then we're going to get into the doctrinal mess that the church is already in today. So I just want to encourage all of you, including myself, to do that. Danny Edwards, George, Will, Shane, Hickman. Great to have all of you with us today. Okay, why don't we get into the Word of God right now. Have your Bibles open, please. And I want you to go with me. Esther, chapter number 9. And let's look at verse number 26. Look at a few verses here. Esther 9 and verse 26 says this. And I want you to circle these words with your pen, uh, if you have a pen with you there. Wherefore, they call these days Purim. Circle Purim. After the name of Pur, singular, P-U-R. Therefore, all the words of this letter, and of that which they had seen concerning this matter, and which had come unto them. Drop down to verses 28 and 29. And, the, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation. Every family, every province, and every city. And that these days of Purim, circle that, should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Verse 29. Then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abihel and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm the second letter of Purim. Drop down to verses 31 and 32. To confirm these days of Purim and their times appointed, according as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them, and as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed the matters of the fastings of their cry. And the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim. And it was written in the book. So we see where this festival originated. Think about this with me for a moment. <laughs> Whenever something bad happens to the Jewish people, they make a holiday out of it. A holiday is born out of it. We see this with the Passover. We see this with Purim. We see it with Hanukkah. Uh, you know, Passover being one of the feasts of Leviticus 23, Purim and Hanukkah not a part of those feasts. With the Passover, well, you all know, Pharaoh was hell-bent on wanting to kill the Jews. With Purim, Haman wanted to kill the Jews <clears throat> in Persia. With Hanukkah, Antiochus IV Epiphanes wanted to kill the Jews and outlaw Judaism altogether. <laughs> there is a saying in Judaism that goes this way. They tried to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. <laughs> That's, they say that during the Passover. They tried to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. That's a saying amongst the Jews during Passover. That has been the same status quo throughout the centuries by Israel's enemies. And folks, you know, the same is true today. 
The enemies of the Jewish people seek their demise. The enemies of the Jewish people seek their extinction. But, as they say in Hebrew, Am Israel Chai. The people of Israel live. Why? This is because of the God of Israel. Mark Twain, who was an atheist, he visited the Holy Land at one time. And when he was there, he said, I thought the Bible says this was the land of milk and honey. He says, look at it. It's a barren wasteland because he visited the Holy Land during the occupation of the Ottoman Turks. And they, they occupied the land for some 400 years. <clears throat> this was before the Jews started coming into the land. And when the Jews started coming back into the land, the land itself began to respond by blossoming, which fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 35 <clears throat> and verse number 1. But Mark Twain made a comment about the Jewish people, <clears throat> excuse me, when he said in his book concerning the Jews, he opined, and this is what he said, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Persians rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out. And they sit in twilight now, or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what always was, exhibited no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal, but the Jew, all other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? <laughs> Folks, that came from an atheist. That came from Mark Twain. What is the immortality of the Jew? Well, it's simple. It's lined out in Scripture, the God of Israel. The book of Esther is a prime example of Jewish survival and heroism. As they faced extinction back then. If Israel, listen to me very closely. If Israel's enemies have their way in the book of Esther, in killing Esther and wiping out the Jews, there would have been no birth of Jesus, the Messiah. Let me say that again so that it can sink into your cerebellum. If the enemies of Israel had their way, and killing Esther and wiping out the Jews in Persia, there would have been no birth of Jesus the Messiah. The Messianic Jewish bloodline, beginning in Genesis 3.15, would have been cut off. But aren't you glad God is always one step ahead of the game? That's the reason why in 2011 I wrote the book, The Serpent, The Seed, and the second coming. How God has preserved the Messianic Jewish bloodline leading up to the birth of Israel's Messiah, Yeshua, the Lord Jesus. The events of the book of Esther do not take place in Israel, but take place where? In Persia. Today, modern day Iran, a distance of 987 miles to the east. The book of Esther records the marriage of a Jewish heroine, Esther, to a pagan Gentile king, Xerxes. It records the incipient anti-Semitism in the land at that time, at the hand of a man by the name of Haman, who wanted to see the liquidation of all Jews in the land. He wanted to carry out the final solution. Hitler 
wanted to carry out the final solution. Adolf, uh, excuse me, uh, the late Saddam Hussein, which I called Saddam insane, he wanted to carry out the final solution. Iran today, the modern day Persians, they want to carry out the final solution. But God is always one step ahead of the game. The book of Esther explains the origins of the Feast of Purim in the month Adar. A-D-A-R. The book of Esther mentions many, many times the Jewish month Adar. The Jewish month Adar corresponds to late February, early March. And, you know, Jews in Israel today uh, celebrate it like a, like a Jewish Halloween. They dress in costumes. The synagogue services are packed. And uh, they read out of, the, out of the Megillah. I'll explain that in a few moments. Uh, and they'll read the events that happen in the book of Esther. Whenever Esther and Mordecai is mentioned, the whole synagogue erupts in cheers because they're the heroes of the book. But when Haman is mentioned, the infamous name Haman, they drown out his name by stamping their feet on the floor or blowing those things that they use for New Year's uh, Eve or those things that you spin around. I don't know the name of them offhand. They drown out the, no the name of Haman because he is the villain of the book. And so the Jews celebrate the deliverance from the wicked Haman. The book of Esther is not the source of how anti-Semitism originated. And folks, anti-Semitism goes all the way back to the time of Moses. As Pharaoh tried wiping out the Jewish people, he was looking for the final solution, but he failed. Why? God is always a step ahead of the game. The book of Esther. Now, that book covers a 10-year portion from 483 B.C. to 473 B.C. And this is during the reign of Xerxes. He's also known as Assyrius. That, that, that's a Hebrew form of his name. Xerxes is the Greek form of his name. The events of Esther are also recorded in the 6th and 7th chapters of the book of Ezra. And again... The heroes of the book are Mordecai and Esther. Esther also goes by another name. Most people don't even know this, but the book of Esther tells us that Esther goes by another name. She also goes by the name Hadassah. There is a hospital in Jerusalem, and you've heard of it, Hadassah Hospital, named after the Jewish heroine. Esther. In Esther chapter number one, Queen Vashti refuses to come before King Assyrius. And she is punished and removed as queen. In chapter two, Esther becomes queen. And King Xerxes doesn't even know she's Jewish. But that didn't bother him in the end. Esther becomes queen. She's chosen and marries a Gentile king, King Xerxes. In Esther chapter 2 and verse number 7, she went by the names Esther and Hadassah. Now, Mordecai had raised up Esther like she was his own daughter. But they were both cousins. How do I know that? Esther chapter 2 verse 7 and Esther chapter 2 Verse 15, Mordecai, a Jew, Esther, a Jew, were cousins. In Esther chapter number 3, the murderous plot is underway. Satan, looking to sever the Messianic bloodline, raised up Haman, an anti-Semite. But I want you to notice Haman's nationality. And I want you to notice his political position. Look with me in uh, Esther chapter 3 and verse number 1. Esther chapter 3 and verse number 1. 
In Esther chapter 3 and verse number 1, it says this. After these things did King Assyrius, or Xerxes, promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So King Xerxes promoted Haman to be second in command under the king. But this guy was abusing his position of authority. And yet the Bible tells us Haman was an Agagite. Wait a minute. You need to go, if you want to understand what's going to happen in the end, you got to go back to the beginning. I'm not going to have a whole lot of time to develop this, but let me just say this in a nutshell. In Genesis 36, verses 1, 8, and 9, Esau was the father of the Edomites. In Genesis 36, 12, Esau has a grandson. His name is Amalek. Okay? Amalek is making war with Israel in Exodus 17. But then Amalek has a descendant in uh, 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, it talks about uh, Ag uh, Agag the Amalekite. That's 1 Samuel chapter 15. Agag the Amalekite wanted to kill Jews. And Saul, Israel's first king, failed to do it. So Samuel, the Jewish prophet, had to cut up Agag the Amalekite. He was a descendant of Amalek. Amalek, the grandson of Esau. Samuel had to cut him up in bite-sized pieces. But then when we get to Esther chapter 3 verse 1, it talks about Haman the Agagite. That means he was a descendant of who? Agag. In 1 Samuel chapter number 15. And then Haman had a great, great, great descendant. He's mentioned in the New Testament. Herod the Great. Herod was an Edomite. Esau is the father of the Edomites. Genesis 36, verses 1, 8, and 9. Uh, Herod's father's name was Antiparter. Antiparter was at one time the king of Edom. So no doubt uh, Herod had an Edomite ancestry. His mother was Jewish, but his father was an Edomite. So he had the best of both worlds, I guess, there. But then... We see that the Edomites, when they were conquered there at Petra by the uh, people from Saudi Arabia, the Nabataeans, those Edomites fled over into southern Judah. Their names changed from uh, Edomites to Idumeans. You've heard of that phrase, Idumeans. It's a Greek corruption of Edom, Edomites. But when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, those Idumeans fled north to what is today Bosnia. And then when World War II broke out, one of the highest ranking uh, Islamic muftis in the Middle East goes to Berlin to meet with Adolf Hitler, Hajj Aman al-Husseini. And they both conspired on how to kill Jews. And then Adolf Hitler tells Hajj Aman al-Husseini, go to Bosnia and gather a massive Muslim army Go down to the Middle East, kill every single Jew. We Germans will kill the Jews in Europe. You Muslims kill the Jews in the Middle East. And by the way, Hajiman al Husseini had a nephew. His name was Yasser Arafat. So we clearly see the Edomite family tree leading up to a people today called who? The Palestinians. Esau, Amalek, Agag, Haman, Herod the Great, Edomians, Hajiman al-Husseini, Yasser Arafat, and who do we have today? The Palestinians. Palestinians are descendants from the ancient Edomites. I've, I've preached this many, many, many times in the past, but I just wanted to throw that background there to you. Satan raised up Haman, and his nationality is that he is an Agagite, he is within the Edomite family tree. 
And when we look at verses 4 and look at uh, verses 4 and 5, it says this. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, talking about the Jews. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Assyrius, even the people of Mordecai. Now Mordecai is a Jew. Don't forget that. And Jews live and die by Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 4. Jesus as a Jew, as a rabbi, lived by Deuteronomy 6.4. In Deuteronomy 6.4 in Hebrew, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Mordecai says, I'm not bowing down to some Gentile. I only bow down to the God of Israel. I only worship the God of Israel. During World War II, when Jews walked by German officials, they had to bow down to them. And failing to do so cost them their lives. Mordecai is walking by Haman. Haman was expecting Mordecai to bow to him. Mordecai didn't. And Haman was enraged. And that's when he said, I'm going to kill every Jew in the province of Persia. In the palace of Shushan. In that whole area. I'm going to kill every single Jew. And when Haman found out that Mordecai was a Jew, it angered him even more. Haman now seeks to wipe out the Jews in Persia. Look with me in Esther chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. He goes to the king, gets permission from the king. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, talking about the Jews. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to, to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Drop down to verse 13. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children, women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, late February, early March, and to take the spoil of them for a prayer. You know why? I think Haman knew his history. I remember what your Jewish prophet did to my ancestor, Agag, the Amalekite. And I remember your first king, Saul, killed all of my people, the young, the old, the middle-aged, all the animals. Now I'm going to return the favor back to you Jews. Haman now seeks to wipe out the Jews in Persia. In Esther chapter 4, the Jews learn of the plot. And Esther calls for a fast among the Jews of Persia. Now, the key verse of the book of Esther is Esther chapter 4 and verse number 14. And this is what it says. For if thou altogether hold thy, holdest thy peace... At this time, then there shall be enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But if thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther, if you and your people remain silent in the midst of this chaos, and if you don't do nothing about it, Haman will kill all your people. Esther, you have been raised up for such a time as this. And boy, is that ever so true. If you remember early on in the book, in Esther chapter number 2, Mordecai overheard a plot by two of the king's chamberlains, two of the king's servants, to assassinate King Xerxes. Mordecai learned of the plot, informed Esther... Esther informed the king, and the two men were hung. So the king owed Mordecai. Now, some time goes by. Haman is now preparing gallows all over Persia 
to hang all the Jews. In Esther chapter number 5, Esther, Esther risked her life coming before the king. Listen, you just don't show up in front of the king of Persia. By doing so, it would cost you your life. If you showed up in front of the king of Persia, and if he failed to you know, raise his uh, sepulcher to you, to stretch it out, you're dead on the spot. So, Esther needed the, even though she was married to the king, she was a queen, the same applied to her. Esther says, I need to get to the king as soon as possible. She risked her life coming before the king, and she informs him of Haman's plot. But king, I got to remind you of something. Do you remember what my cousin Mordecai did for you some time ago? He uncovered a plot about your assassination. And you're alive today because of what my cousin Mordecai did in saving your life. In Esther, chapter number 6, King Xerxes forces Haman to honor Mordecai the Jew. And this happened at Esther's banquet. Despite the king signing this into law to let Haman do whatever he wants, when he found out, when he remembered what Mordecai did for him and how much he loved Esther, he said, I'll do anything for you, Esther. I'm in love with you. You're my wife. Haman's trying to kill you. That's not going to happen. And so we looked at Haman and he said, don't you dare harm the Jews. And by the way, I expect you to be at my wife's banquet. You better be there. Can you imagine the humiliation? The king comes to the banquet. Haman comes in. The Bible said his head was covered. Why? He was in shame. He was embarrassed. That Now he has to bow down to Mordecai. But it doesn't stop there. In chapter 7, Haman is hung on his own gallows that he prepared for the Jews. After Esther revealed to the king who was responsible for all these gallows around Persia. Haman wanted to hang my people. Haman wanted to kill my people. This Agagite, this Edomite, this descendant of Esau wanted to kill my people. And that enraged King Assyrius. And he said, take Haman and all those that were trying to kill the Jews and hang them on every single gallow in Persia. In chapter number 8, Mordecai, Esther's cousin who raised her up since she was a baby, is advanced and honored by the king. Esther's plea to the king was to remove Haman's letters to kill all the Jews. Look at me in, in Esther chapter 8, verses 3 and 5. Esther chapter 8, verses 3 and 5, and it says this, And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with great with tears, to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Verse 5. Then said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the provinces. And that's exactly what the king did. Not only did King Assyrius reverse Haman's orders to kill the Jews, but King Xerxes gave authority to the Jews to defend themselves. You have every right to defend yourselves. That's exactly when Vice President Mike Pence recently said, the Jews have a right to defend themselves. And today, 2,600 years later, 
when the Jews defend themselves, they're condemned by the world. Israel has a right to exist. Israel has a right to defend themselves, just as King Xerxes told Esther and Mordecai and the Jews of Persia, you have every right to defend yourselves. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what the Jews did. They cleaned house. In chapter number 9, the Jews destroy their enemies. And what we read in Esther chapter 9, verse 26, verse 28, verse 29, verse 30, verse 31, we see the birth of a new Jewish holiday, Purim. Purim is plural for lots, L-O-T-S, lots, no, cast in lots, as they did in biblical times. It's also called in the Bible, pur, P-U-R, that's singular for lot, L-O-T. Why? Because Haman cast lots to determine where Jews would be killed and hung in the province of Persia. It all backfired on Haman. Why? I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Now, what's unique about the book of Esther is that there is a name that is missing throughout the 10 chapters of this book. And the name that is missing in the book of Esther is the name of God. God's name is not mentioned once in the book of Esther. If I'm not mistaken, God's name isn't even mentioned in the Song of Solomon's. The Song of Solomon doesn't mention the name of God. And the book of Esther does not mention the name of God once. But yet, God's sovereignty and His providence is evident throughout the entire book. All ten chapters leading to the preservation of the Jewish people. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered by a Bedouin Arab boy in 1947, looking for a lost sheep near the Dead Sea, he threw a stone into the cave to flush some of the sheep out. He heard the shattering of pottery. And when he went inside, he made the greatest discovery of the 20th century. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. All the books of the Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered except for one book. One book of the Bible was not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was the book of Esther. Why? My sanctified speculation is this. And maybe you might have another uh, reason. I'd be more than happy to hear it. There was a group of Jews called the Essenes 2,000 years ago. They hated the religious and political corruption going on among the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jerusalem under Roman occupation. They broke away from that. And they wanted to produce a, they wanted to start a pure society, if you will. A pure sect. A pure lifestyle. Wholly devoted to God. The Essenes mentioned and wrote about God in everything. The first thing they did when they woke up in the morning was mention God. God was the first name to come out of their mouths. Before they went to bed at night, the last name to come out of their mouth was God. Hashem in Hebrew. When they wrote everything, God was mentioned. They mentioned God in all their writings. God was on their lips throughout the whole entire day. <clears throat> the Essenes were the ones responsible for writing the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were the ones that were responsible for putting those scrolls in the jars and putting them in those caves 
because they knew the Romans were coming. And with the Romans coming, they knew that the Romans would burn those Dead Sea Scrolls. So they hid them in those caves. The Romans no doubt killed the Essenes, but those scrolls were hid and preserved. It's my guess that the Essenes did not want to copy the book of Esther because the book of Esther doesn't mention the name of God. But what does that say for the Song of Solomon? Because it doesn't mention the name of God either, but Song of Solomon was also found among the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Bible, but not the book of Esther. The Essenes mention God in everything. Because Esther doesn't mention God's name. The Essenes refuse to copy that book. That's just my speculation. That's my take on it. Now, in the synagogue services, as I said already, the rabbi reads from the Megillah. What is the Megillah? The Megillah is Hebrew for a scroll. There are five Megillahs in the Hebrew canon of the scriptures. Esther is the only one to be commonly read from a handwritten parchment scroll. And they do that in the synagogues for the Purim services. Again, when the rabbi mentions Mordecai and Esther, it's to a bunch of cheers. They're the heroes of the book. When the rabbi mentions the infamous Haman, they drown out his name with bulls and all types of deafening noise. Why? Haman tried to destroy the Jews in biblical times. And Haman's descendants are trying to do the same thing today. Again, beginning with Esau, leading up to the people who call themselves the Palestinians today. Also, Xerxes was a friend to the Jews, a Persian. Before him, Cyrus was a friend to the Jews. Cyrus was mentioned 150 years before he was even born. And Isaiah 44, 28. And Isaiah 45, verses 1, 4, and 13. Cyrus would conquer the Babylonian Empire in 539 B.C. and allow the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to build the second temple. So Cyrus was a friend to the Jews, a Gentile king. King Xerxes was a friend to the Jews. He married a Jew. He married Esther. But the modern day Persians today are not so friendly to other Jewish people. The modern day Persians today are the Iranians. They call for Israel to be wiped off the face of the map every single day. They are one of the most lethal enemies of the Jewish people today. And we see the prophecy in Psalm 83 verse 4. They have said, come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. Psalm 83 describes, describes an Arab attack upon the Jewish people. Arab nations uh, that share a common border with Israel. Ezekiel 38-39 talks about a Russian-led Arab attack on Israel. Nations who don't share a common border with Israel. And Daniel 11, 40 through 45, parallel with Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. Do you know the Iranians today? They don't speak Arabic. Even though the country is ruled by Islamic Sharia law, they don't speak Arabic. You know what language I, the I, Iranians speak? They speak Farsi. They still speak the Persian language. They still retain the Persian language but not so friendly to other Jews. Iran, according to the Bible prophecy, will join Russia and other Arab allies to attack Israel in Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. And yet, in Ezekiel 38, 5, it talks about Persia joining the attack. Well, Persia, in 1936, changed their name to Iran. Do you know what the word Iran means? Land of the Aryans. And the reason why they changed their name from Persia to Iran is because of Nazi influence when Nazi officials visited the land at that time. God has preserved Israel over the centuries and he will continue 
to do so. Why? Psalm 121 and verse 4 says this, and I love it. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Psalm 25, 22, redeem Israel, O God, out of all her troubles. And I would agree with the late Mark Twain. What is the immortality of the Jew? How does he do it? The Romans are gone. The Babylonians are gone. The Assyrians are gone. The Medo-Persian Empire is gone. The Grecian Empire is gone. The mighty Roman Empire. Adolf Hitler is gone. Saddam Hussein is gone. But the Jews are still here. Why? Psalm 121 verse 4. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Israel's back in the land, but they're back in the land in unbelief. That's Romans 11.25. And this is in preparation for the final 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. That final seven-year period of tribulation. That's Daniel 9.24. A time of Jacob's trouble. That's Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse number 7. Despite this final seven-year period to come upon unbelieving Israel, and the unbelieving Gentile nations of the world, Israel shall be saved. How do I know that? Romans chapter 11 and verse number 26. This happens at Jesus' second coming, at the end of the seven-year period of tribulation. In conclusion, the events that happened in Shushan the palace in Persia 2,600 years ago remind us that Haman's modern-day descendants are ready to make their move to wipe out Israel. Bible prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, will be fulfilled. That means the rapture of the church must be so close at hand. And all we can say to that is Maranatha, even so come. Lord Jesus. So to all of you watching and to all of our Israeli friends, I would once again say Chag Sameach. Happy holidays. Tonight, sundown, it's the festival of Purim. There might even be a synagogue, there might even be a synagogue next year that's going to have a Purim celebration. I know with the coronavirus and all that stuff, but I would, you know, go. No, they invite everyone to come to a Purim service. It's absolutely, it's, you really learn a lot there. But when I look at the events that happened here in the book of Esther that led up to the birth of Purim does remind me that Bible prophecy will be fulfilled. Well, I want to say hello to Stacy Kauf Kaufman Williams, Jesus Padilla. Good to see you, brother. We just talked yesterday over the phone. Pray for you this morning, buddy. Patricia Rask, good to see you, Patricia. Darlene Lautner, Bill Osga, good to see Bill. Junior Parker, Denise Imbody, Imbody, hope I said that right. Millie Marin Flores, great to see you, Millie. Christine David uh, Davidson, Mershwal. Uh, don't forget, our tour's been uh, rescheduled for June 20th to Israel. Shane Hickman, and I think I may have gotten to everyone else. And again, guys, thank you so much. For tuning in today. We also have Pastor Don Chitty just joined us, but we just ended the broadcast today, Brother Don. But we're going to upload this so that you can watch this in its entirety. And we're also going to upload this to YouTube. So you can watch it on YouTube as well. Thank you, Artemio. You always end off our broadcast with God bless you, brother, and Miss Ros Mrs. Rosado and family. I appreciate that. Thank you. So very much. So, again, thank you for joining us. Visit my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Sign up for my newsletters by going to the contact form. Give me your name and your email address. You'll start receiving our newsletters. They go out every Monday. Because we have to reschedule our Israel Prophecy Tour, it's now uh, scheduled for June 20th through the 30th. If you want to come to Israel with us, 
Hopefully the ban will be lifted. This coronavirus goes away. And we'll be on our way to Israel June 20th through the 30th. So if you want to come to Israel, make preparations to come with us now. Look at my speaking schedule to see if we'd be at a church near you. Joshua, I love you too. <laughs> and Bevakasha, you're very welcome. And it's great when I can get encouragement like that from brothers in the Lord. That doesn't happen all the time from Christians, it's, it's sad to say. But I uh, appreciate you, Joshua. Yahashua, your name is similar to Jesus' name in Hebrew. Yeshua, Yahashua, Yeshua. Salvation. Okay, I digress. Anyway, uh, come with us. Listen, because we had to postpone, I got three open Sundays between, uh, let me see if I can get those dates right now. I got three open Sundays between March 22nd and April the 7th. Three open Sundays to preach at a church on Bible prophecy. If you're a pastor and you would like to have me come to your church to talk about Israel, Bible prophecy, and current events, please notify us here through Facebook Messenger or send me an email, august.todayinbibleprophecy at gmail.com. And we'd love to come up with one of those dates to come to your church to talk about things like this. You didn't get any drama with me today, no sensationalism. All I did was teach a plain sense interpretation of Bible prophecy. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. And so, Jesus says, praying for you, my friend, hoping the ban will be lifted by then. Me too, Jesus. Me too. So, again, guys, join us tomorrow, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another Bible prophecy update. So, if you're just tuning in right now, we're going to upload this video to my Facebook timeline in a few minutes, and then I'll have it uploaded to YouTube. If you don't want anyone who's deaf, like my, name, my, my landlords downstairs, they're deaf, and I got them to do the closed caption on the YouTube. All they got to do is hit that CC button, and they can read what I'm, what I'm saying. And so if you know someone like that, then you can do the same thing from the, for them as well. All right, folks, we'll see you tomorrow. Hope you enjoy your day today. Uh, be safe, stay healthy, wash your hands. And remember, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And once again, Chag Sameach. Happy Purim to all of you watching today. God bless, guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.